There's lots of water in oceans, rivers, and lakes. But living things deep beneath the surface also need oxygen to live. And when oxygen is in short supply, it has sea creatures singing the O2 blues. Hey, this is just what we needed, an aerator. I'll set it up just like this. I think Squirt and his friends will be a lot more comfortable now. Why was the water so cloudy before we changed it? It might have had something to do with bacteria, fungi, or microscopic organisms using up a lot of the oxygen in the water. Or temperatures could have gotten too warm, also reducing the water's ability to hold oxygen. None of these scenarios are good for squirt. So the aerator puts the oxygen back into the water? That's right. Let's step outside. I want to show you something. We have algae and other phytoplankton out here right now. Why? Well, we usually have some because of the nutrients that are usually here. But recently, a golf course opened out that way. And extra nitrogen and phosphorus are now getting into the water. They may be using too much fertilizer or not taking precautions to minimize the runoff. Where do those chemicals come from? Well, think about the really nice grass that golfers want on a golf course. Fertilizers are routinely added to keep the grass green and lush. And these fertilizers are prime sources for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium washing into the water when it rains. And the golf course has its own wastewater plant. This is a small-scale version of wastewater treatment plants that cities use all over the country. Did you know that even though those facilities remove toxic chemicals from the water, the water is still not pure? It has what's called nitrates remaining after the treatment. They can cause problems to both humans and fish. All of that nutrient enrichment hitting our little pond is known as eutrophication. What? Eutrophication, the enrichment of water by addition of nutrients. It might be fun to take a closer look. Let's do a eutrophication magnification. Phytoplankton are the microscopic plants both in marine systems and in freshwater systems. They are real plants just like trees and shrubs and grass. Phytoplankton are small plants, mostly microscopic plants, and phytoplankton play an important role in the food chain. They are the primary producers, which means that they carry on the important process of photosynthesis in the environment. Phytoplankton are microscopic algae that live in both ocean waters and in freshwater environments. They're actually the largest oxygen producers on the planet. They produce more oxygen than, than rainforests. They produce more oxygen than trees and lawns and everything else that we see that's green. Most people don't realize that any lake, ocean, or beach they go to and they go swimming, all that water is full of millions and millions of tiny little phytoplankton. So when you take a mouthful of water, you may have 10 million phytoplankton. Zooplankton are small animals, mostly microscopic. They play an important role in the food chain. Uh, they play a role as consumers and then they also serve as food for the larger animals. Zooplankton can consist of animals in the water that do not move from location to location on their own. They're carried by currents in the oceans or in lakes. The phytoplankton have both light and nutrients. All of a sudden they start growing and they grow and they grow and they grow. And that's a good thing up to a point because those phytoplankton are eaten by little zooplankton the little zooplankton are eaten by fish, so it produces fish and shrimp just like we would like it to do. But eventually, if there are too many nutrients coming down the river, you get too many phytoplankton growing, the animals can't keep up with eating them. Even though the phytoplankton can undergo rapid growth, or algal blooms as it's called, they have very short lifespans of just a few hours. After the phytoplankton die, they drop to the bottom of the ocean or lake and are decomposed by armies of bacteria, which quickly consume oxygen in the water. The zooplankton, or tiny animals, drop waste, called fecal pellets, which fall to the bottom of the lake, ocean, or river. And that's also decomposed. 
using up more precious oxygen. Eventually, if it's not resupplied, it gets to the point that it becomes hypoxic or low oxygen, or it becomes anoxic and has no oxygen. All that's left there are a few bacteria that can live in environments that are low oxygen, and nothing else lives in the water. So as a result of this excess plant growth, uh, we end up with no oxygen in the bottom water. Once the oxygen level drops below a certain point, then the fish can no longer effectively breathe. This is why at times we'll have fish kills in certain environments. The fish no longer just, just no longer have the, the amount of oxygen available to them to be able to breathe. So what are some of the terms you've learned? Phytoplankton. They're microscopic plants that float in the water. And zooplankton are tiny microscopic animal-like organisms. Eutrophication is the process where the water becomes nutrient rich, helping microscopic plants to grow. Hypoxia means there are low levels of oxygen in the water. And anoxia means that there's no oxygen in the water. If you hold your breath for 15 seconds, by medical definition, your blood has gone hypoxic. Holy mackerel! Now, let's take an even closer look at water. The water molecule is part oxygen, but that's not the oxygen that aquatic life uses. Oxygen from the air, or that is released by aquatic plants, dissolves in water, and that's the oxygen that water organisms consume. Depending upon the temperature and salinity, or salt content, a concentration of less than two parts of dissolved oxygen per million parts of water is known as hypoxia. Colder water usually holds more dissolved oxygen than warmer water. Now, let's get hypoxia's big picture. This is the Gulf of Mexico, near the mouth of the Mississippi River. Fresh water from 40% of the United States and parts of Canada drains into this gulf. Economically, the river and the gulf are worth billions of dollars to both farmers and fishermen. But an increasing lack of oxygen literally threatens to make the once vibrant and living Gulf of Mexico into a dead zone. Right now we're on the bow of the Pelican. We've just come back from a day of studying hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico. The Mississippi River, because it's so large, also delivers a lot of nutrients to the Gulf of Mexico, primarily the nitrogen and phosphorus that, that stimulate the growth of the phytoplankton. And those phytoplankton grow in the surface waters. They're either eaten by animals or they sink to the bottom and die and decompose. And during that process of decomposition, the bacteria use up the oxygen. The word hypoxia itself means below oxygen, so the oxygen is below normal. One of the issues with hypoxia is that organisms basically can't survive and they have to flee from the area or they die. And some of the most important economic uh, features of the Louisiana coastal zone are its fisheries. And those fish and crabs and shrimp depend on oxygen just like you and me. And if there's not enough oxygen, they can't live there. This is Skeletonema costatum. It's the main culprit in terms of hypoxia here in the Louisiana coastal zone. This organism is one of the main bloom formers. Good zooplankton food, but it just, it is able to respond really quickly to an increase in nutrients and just grows in tremendous profusion. If you drove from Chicago, Illinois to Des Moines, Iowa, that would be the length across the whole hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico. The nutrients come from wastewater treatment from cities, it comes from industrial discharges, it comes from fertilizer applied to farmland, it comes from the air because of burning of fossil fuels. So these nutrients come from many sources. Another factor of hypoxia involves layering. Fresh water flows on top of the heavier salt water of the Gulf. Oxygen from the surface can be cut off from those deeper layers of water contributing to hypoxia. Floods and other natural disasters can also contribute to hypoxia. Constantly studying variables of hypoxia, such as nutrients, weather, and temperature, Rabelais and her researchers know there's a lot of work yet to be done. Hypoxia has taken many decades to develop to the point that it is in the Gulf of Mexico, so it's going to take a long time for the system to recover. I think we've shown that it's a problem, and that it's a problem that people have contributed to and that people can solve. Agricultural runoff from the Midwest can have a big impact in creating eutrophic conditions further south in the Gulf of Mexico. 
That's why farmers and researchers are being encouraged to use BMPs, or Best Management Practices. These are methods that help reduce the amount of fertilizer nutrients that get into the Mississippi River and potentially into the Gulf of Mexico. Well, basically, the Midwest is the breadbasket of the country, and, and uh, predominantly uh, row crop, especially in Illinois, Iowa, northern Missouri, those, those areas, a lot of corn and soybeans. I'm a sixth generation farmer on this ground. Uh, Grandma and Grandpa have the uh, land grant from Van Buren when he was president. And so we've, we've had this ground for a long time. We grow mostly corn and beans here. I think 1,000 acres of corn this year and about 800 acres of soybeans. As a producer, certainly his livelihood depends on having productive soils and having that soil be in the family, being able to be passed down generation to generation. And so it's in his best interest to do everything he possibly can to maintain that productivity and be a good steward of the land. Farmers aren't blameless. Uh, we've all, I mean, we use the nitrogen, we use the fertilizers that are on the ground. We have to use them to produce that crop. But uh, it's the idea of farmers are now starting to, and have for a long time, started to put on that fertilizer responsibly. Uh, you only put on what you need for that crop. Eutrophication is a natural process. Uh, but what happens is we exacerbate it or we make it worse uh, by, by some of our things that we do uh, uh, living here on this planet. Uh, obviously there's good and bad in anything you do. People have to eat, so we have to have farmers. We have to have people uh, planting crops or, or else uh, people will go hungry. Fertilizers in the water is not something that we want to happen and that it'll cost us money and it's bad for the environment. We've encouraged that producers calculate what they need and, and apply only that amount and not to exceed it. Okay, this uh, technology is called a spad meter, and what this actually does is it measures the greenness of a leaf. And we can use that to estimate the nitrogen content of that plant and help us schedule additional fertilizer, or if the plant has enough fertilizer, we can simply not add any more. Other BMPs include reducing erosion and runoff through no-till crops, grass strips, and fertilizing at the right time. By not tilling the soil, many nutrients remain in the ground instead of flowing into water systems. Grass strips at the end of fields help absorb floating sediments which contain nutrients. And fertilizing at the right temperature helps nutrients to be better absorbed into the ground and less easily washed away. Farmers are able to keep more of the sediment and the fertilizer in the soil and keep it from washing away into the uh, rivers or into the water supply and or at least keep some of it out of the water supply and that's the uh, that's another goal that's a uh, that's good for the environment and it's good for the farmer. Nutrients can come from a number of different sources uh, we can look at, at septic systems for example that may have uh, problems with the, some of the nutrients leaking out of the septic systems we know that municipal sewage treatment plants also contribute uh, we can look at just the natural cycling that occurs uh, we can look at livestock operations in some areas that also contribute to this, this particular situation. So that the real challenge is to identify where the sources are and see where we can have the biggest impact. So it's not only the farmer's responsibility, but everyone who uses fertilizers and anything that can run off into the groundwater, to, you've got to keep it safe, you've got to do it responsibly. Long Island Sound in New York doesn't only get hypoxic, this body of water often becomes anoxic. That means no oxygen. What's the culprit? Wastewater treatment, urban runoff, and just the right temperatures all help phytoplankton to grow and bloom. Decomposition of microscopic organisms and their waste causes this frequent absence of oxygen in Long Island Sound. Geologists have found fossil evidence in the US for an hypoxic, maybe even an anoxic event from more than 60 million years ago. The Chesapeake Bay area could be considered a classic river-based hypoxia laboratory. In the 1950s after World War II, this region flourished with lots of cars. Nitrous oxide was added to the air from the vehicle emissions. Factories dumped wastewater without stringent limits on pollution. Building left lands cleared, which created a direct path for runoff water, carrying fertilizer and other chemicals into the bay. Those factors, along with natural cycles, steadily increased eutrophication from the 50s to the 80s. Chesapeake Bay is an estuary where salt water from the ocean and fresh water from rivers mix. If you take some 
oil and vinegar dressing, it's kind of like the bay. Put some vinegar into some water, and then you add your oil. The oil is less dense than the water, and so it floats on top. So that's like the fresh water. The vinegar and water becomes like the salt water, and it will stay separate. This water up here has plenty of oxygen, but this water down here can get oxygen depleted. And the fresh water end is where most of the basic nutrients enter the bay and mix with the water and fertilize the phytoplankton populations. The two primary elements that the, the phytoplankton want to grow are phosphorus and nitrogen. And the phytoplankton say, well, this is great. We have plenty of food now, and they start growing. The phytoplankton production eventually dies and sinks to the bottom. Oxygen levels go down. And when oxygen gets low enough, the fish and the crabs start leaving and eventually conditions go to where there's no oxygen in the bottom water and the organisms die. We have to continuously strike a balance on the bay. We have more people who want to live by these beautiful shores and just their mere presence increases nutrient loads. And we have to remember that phytoplankton, like plants, produce oxygen during the daytime as a byproduct of photosynthesis, but at night they use oxygen, just like animals. So about five o'clock in the morning, you have nobody producing oxygen, and you have lots of organisms using up oxygen, and larger organisms tend to die off, and that's another way that hypoxia can affect organisms in the bay. People in the area are now integrating more plants as buffer zones to catch nutrient runoff, cutting down use of fertilizers, and trying to use less fuel and electricity. All of this to prevent the Chesapeake from becoming a dead zone. As a Bay community, we've managed to reduce the nutrient inputs of nitrogen by about 20%. And we're hoping now that this will be enough for the Bay water quality to improve. I want to see a, a clean Bay that has a nice balance. I want my kids to be able to go crabbing and catch fish on the Bay. The the uh, idea behind regulating nutrients and controlling their input into the bay is to improve the water quality, which will reduce the amount of low oxygen bottom in the bay and open that bottom up for use by crabs and fish and, and other organisms all year round. We've learned there's an important relationship between what goes in our water and the conditions that follow. It's all about knowing and controlling nutrient levels in the water, and hopefully minimizing the chances of hypoxia or anoxia. Well, I'm sure glad that things are getting back to normal for Squirt and his friends. Yeah, now they have oxygen and the food they need. Did somebody say food? Why don't we get a bite to eat? Good idea. And anoxia means that there's no oxygen in the water. Oxygen? <laughs> Say what? I'm sure glad things are back to normal for Squirt and his friends. You made it worse. <laughs> Never mind. I'm sure glad that things are better now for Squirt and his friends. Thank you. What am I trying to say? <laughs> Green flies. They found us. You have to sacrifice for your science. <laughs> to learn more, visit the EnviroTackle Box website.